Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us at our uh, Shapers of Change uh, Summit. Um, this is the, the uh, second uh, kind of major summit we've done, but we've, we've been holding a series of of thought leadership uh, events um, the last few months, and you know we hope to keep that going uh, uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and kind of what you know today we have. Uh, uh, interesting agenda, but I, I want to just start off by telling, you know, for those that don't know us, uh, who Direct Agents is and what we do. Um, so, you know, Direct Agents, we're a digital uh, performance marketing agency, really focused on uh, uh, growth uh, marketing and uh, customer acquisition. Uh, we've have, uh, we have the pleasure of working uh, uh, and align, aligning ourselves with a number of great brands um, across uh, e-commerce, uh, retail, travel, uh, financial services, media and entertainment, um, you know, across many, many different sectors. Um, so we're, you know, we're excited today to share some of the uh, kind of learnings we have from, from some of these areas. We're going to touch on a, a couple of different, a uh, couple of different industries uh, today. Uh, so the agenda, you know, I'm going to start out with uh, some, some opening remarks. Um, we have uh, the CEO, of uh, box.com good friend of mine che wong he's going to uh, join in this first uh, first half an hour for for q a um, uh, later on we're going to have a panel on uh, amazon the future of e-commerce uh future fashion and we'll end up uh, with the future storytelling um so before can i go into you know the the, the content um i did want to pause and, and talk a little bit about the, the current, current situation in the country uh, we were originally supposed to have this conference two weeks ago, and then um, due to kind of the unfortunate uh, events uh, around George, George Floyd's death and the um, you know, the protests, we we decided to pause it. Um, I did I did want to mention, you know, as as an agency, especially as a kind of um, a minority owned um, you know, agency, uh, we've you know we've been very cognizant of of you know kind of the diversity. Um, frankly, our, our industry is not that diverse, and um, you know we've, as an agency, tried to differentiate ourselves and separate, and been very uh, conscious of what, what our workforce looks like, that it accurately reflects, um, you know, the the, you know, the cities we're in and the you know the consumers that we were uh, that we are, are trying to sell to, um, and I think it's just an, it's a good time for all all businesses and everyone, especially marketers and uh, you know business leaders uh, like ourselves. Uh, kind of to, to pause and use this time to to have these kind of conversations and, and to think, think through it. So I know as at Direct Agents, we've been doing that internally. We've you know we, uh, the last uh, you know few weeks especially, but you know for 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 quite some time. But um, you know we hope to have that dialogue with our our partners and our our clients as well. Uh, so moving into some of the trends. Uh, you know, I, I, the, at the last uh, you know, couple couple of uh, summits we've had, um, you know, I've, I've shared some data on what the state of the reopening is in the country. You know, when we first we had our first summit in in, in um, uh, early April, uh, and you know, it was a very different picture. So as you can kind of see, uh, this is from a Goldman Sachs kind of composite index of various different factors, uh, financial, um, government rules, um, different mobility indexes, but kind of really just see where the state of the, the country is in terms of, of reopening. Uh, currently, um, kind of using you know, uh, February as a, as, a, as a starting point, uh, being the 100 index, where as a, as a country about, uh, you know, kind of 51% there. I know different states are, are, are at different uh, levels. Uh, New York City just announced uh, phase two reopening. So, uh, kind of as, as marketers, um, you know, it's something to kind of keep keep uh, keep an eye on uh, as this uh, reopening index hopefully just keeps going up. You know what the trends are we see on the other side, um, and then kind of diving into that, some of the kind of specific different elements um, you can see what has been over indexed and under indexed. So um, some of the kind of the usage that you know we've all been uh, kind of leaning into, whether it be video streaming gaming, uh, online grocery shopping, uh, you know, all, all those have, have kind of really grown uh, year over year, right? So this is basically then the last week compared to a year ago, um, but still you know, many of the categories uh, that involve anything uh, travel related, uh, live events um, are, are, are still uh, considerably down. Um, so this, you know, maybe, you know hopefully we'll, we'll keep looking at this every, every few weeks and see how this continues to 
to change. Interestingly enough, um, a big ticket item, home, buy, you know, home, uh, home buying, is up 22%. So, um, you know, I think there's even, it's not just the obvious ones like e-commerce and shopping, but, um, you, know, you, know, major, uh, you know, major initiatives for consumers like buying new homes is up. Um, so one, one of the things we did as an agency early on um, is build out uh, dashboards, uh, you know, from the Amazon kind of uh, Amazon uh, keyword search data, uh, really just to give us a pulse of what was happening within the Amazon ecosystem. We work with a number of brands within Amazon. Um, one, and we have this available. So if you know, if, if later on, if anyone needs access to it, we have a kind of a real time pulse. Every every you know, week, it gets updated with across a bunch of different categories. Um, but one of the main kind of takeaways from what we've we've witnessed is uh, early on um, you know you can kind of see that those early kind of COVID times uh, big increases in some of the household essentials uh, you know beauty household goods um, you know baby related uh, kind of baby care uh, there's a lot of panic buying uh, now it's actually uh, kind of based on the Amazon search trend data it's normalized a bit um, but what we're you know we're keeping an eye on this is if there is any resurgences you know which categories will start peaking uh, quickly but uh, it, it, it's been really interesting. It's a, a kind of a moving target week by week, but it does give us a, a pulse on what the overall consumer, uh, uh, consumer demand looks like in the country. Um, another uh, kind of another set of tools we put together and, and data sets we were looking at is uh, we compared uh, Apple mobility data. So this is you know, basically at, across the country, how you know, people, what their movement habits are. Um, this, the mobility data is uh, you know, public access, accessible. Um, but we compared it to our uh, all of our uh, campaign data across you know, CPC, Facebook, uh, CPM prices, Google CPCs, just to see what correlations there were, and to make decisions in real time on uh, media mix uh, allocations. Um, so some interesting things that we found and that we're keeping an eye on is just as um, mobility dropped um, in some areas, the so Google um, kind of Google search prices actually went down. Um, but Facebook, uh, you know, prices prices went up, so there's an inverse correlation. Uh, so it kind of helped us determine what you know kind of how, how to reallocate um, campaigns in real time. Uh, also, something we're keeping an eye on. We built these dashboards out. We're keeping an eye on uh, week to week as uh, you know if there is some kind of resurgence, what that has to do to to the marketing mix. Um, but really fascinating kind of to see this. Uh, and then just final data points before we get into the conversation with Che. Uh, and this is a, from a kind of a study from um, Bain Capital, um, and it's just really studied companies in turbulent times. And I think you know the the next uh, you know the last three months especially, and then you know the next year or, or more, um, you know, depending on uh, how things goes, you know, it could be it could be turbulent in different ways. Uh, but I think the really interesting uh, kind of takeaway was even in turbulent times, um, you know, there were many kind of sinking ships, as, as, as they call them, in study of their their performance. Uh, but there were 47% more rising stars um, due to that turbulence. So I think as, you know, I know our company and I think our, our, our clients and our partners, when we look at this, it's okay, if we're not, if we're just staying still, uh, even if it's turbulent time, then, you know, there's a risk of being that kind of that sinking ship. And how do we focus as a company on, uh, you know, finding the trends, finding the strategies at work and, and becoming one of those uh, rising stars. So hopefully today we'll, we'll leave you guys with a little, you know, some takeaways from the different conversations that can help you know, everyone be in, in that, that rising star uh, bucket. Um, so which, uh, without further ado, maybe we'll get uh, Che, uh, Che Wong. Hey, Che. Hey, Josh, what's going on, man? Nothing much. That's All right, super, there you are. I was, uh, I was, uh, I was following along uh, on the slides before, so it was, uh, it was really yeah. interesting. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks for joining, Che. And so, if, you know, for those that don't know, Che is the CEO of Box.com. Um, they're a uh, you know a wholesale uh, a delivery company that has had tremendous success um, over the last uh, few years, and uh, we're really happy to have Che here with us. Um, so, Che, you know, I want to just jump in, and talk a little bit about the trends you've been seeing. I mean, you you know, you probably have access to uh, you know much more uh, granular data than we do. Kind of with consumer habits, um, what's been the impact like on your business the last few months uh, due to COVID? Yeah, um, you know they tracked. All, uh, you know, I was I was like literally leaning in and just like looking at every slide that you were uh, kind of displaying before because it's very consistent with what we saw. So and what we're seeing today. So um, if you rewind back to about mid to late February, uh, mid February, I would say uh, you start to see a bump in demand. 
Um, and especially when you went into late February, early March, that's when it, you know, I would categorize it as unabated demand. Um, and so uh, that uh, continued along um, uh, and frankly still uh, continues today. So we haven't, um, we continue to see a very much increased demand. It's not as spiky as it was before, um, but it does look like we've settled into a new baseline. Uh, more importantly, you know, if you rewind in to, to February or March, I uh, remember everyone was debating whether this was sustainable or not. Is it sticky? Is it not sticky? Um, and at that time, it was like anyone's guess, like, you know, and no one had any data. Uh, it was just all anecdotal. Um, but now that we're 90 plus days in uh, to a post-COVID America, uh, what we're finding is that the cohorts that came in during that time, uh, so far after a quarter of data, have been the stickiest in the history of the company. So uh, not only sticky, but also um, uh, in the amount they spent as well. So I think that bodes well uh, uh, for the future. And I think uh, we're not going to revert just back to the original baseline that we were in uh, this time last year. So you're seeing consumers not only trialed your, your company and started using it for the first time, but are sticking and, and, and may come back. Yeah, you know, uh, especially, you know, it's been a, a larger uh, kind of a larger top of the funnel when it comes to different demographics as well. Uh, traditionally, we've been um, uh, probably a little bit younger than most uh, uh, kind of folks, uh, most retailers, uh, what, you know, most definitely most grocery chains, that's for sure. Um, and so what we've been finding is that we've been able to expand um, uh, higher up in the, in the age groups um, because of this pandemic. A lot of folks just frankly, even though their states are open, just refuse to still go, go do mundane things that they can otherwise do online. Any, any products or categories have really surprised you the, the last few months? Aside from toilet paper? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, aside from toilet paper. I don't, like, you know, I, I've always joked for years now that I'm a giant toilet paper salesperson. Uh, and I couldn't have written this uh, literally like for a movie script. I, you know, you couldn't even have sold it as a movie script. Um, but definitely toilet paper. Uh, where I think the smart money is on is probably paper towels going forward. Um, uh, you know, disinfectant wipes. Um, you know, as people go back to work, as people do go out more, uh, one of the things that will last with us is wiping surfaces down, I think, because um, right. it's not like you are going to the bathroom more, but you definitely will consume way more disinfectant wipes, I think, in the coming uh, months, especially when offices um, uh, uh, reopen. Right. And are you seeing, I know, you, you know, one cohort you have is consumers, but you also focused uh, to sell the businesses. Are you seeing business demand picking up as well? We are, but, you know, what you saw during the last 90 days was extreme tailwinds in the B2C business and also quite strong headwinds in the B2B business because, you know, we traditionally service offices, uh, uh, both small to medium size and also enterprise. And even today, there's just not a lot of folks at work. Um, right. With that said, though, we have seen probably about, since about two to three weeks ago, uh, a pretty steady rise in the B2B business. So we're seeing up to 60, 70 percent week over week growth in, in, uh, in B2B but albeit on severely depressed levels compared to traditional levels of our B2B business. Got it. What about uh, technology? I know, you're, you know your company is, is very a tech first company. Anything that you've, had to, you know, you've used or deployed, especially during the last few months or that you'll be using moving forward? Yeah, so one of the things that we definitely relied on quite a bit to handle the spikes was uh, automation. So uh, being able to fulfill more orders without flooding the building with more people. Um, and thereby increasing the risk of, of kind of um, uh, 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 potentially a cluster within our buildings uh, of infection. So that was definitely something we leveraged and we, we were thinking the whole, whole time, thank gosh, uh, we had made that investment years ago uh, to automate the buildings. Um, the other is just overall kind of um, being able to leverage supply chain and hook it into marketing, uh, as well as hook it into kind of demand uh, uh, generation, but also uh, uh, quelling demand when needed as well. So. Uh, having extreme insight into what is coming onto our docks and when so that we can begin to kind of list it and pre-sell it for certain days. Um, that's been very important for us. At the same time, also understanding what are the exact items driving demand uh, so that in times if we're, hey, we're like, we have all the demand we can get and we're going to start to fall behind on delivery times uh, to actually begin to maybe pull some of those uh, items off of the shelf or pull them off of search or pull them off of kind of um, uh, certain category pages um, that has really helped us maintain a good kind of uh, uh, SLA with the customer. Oh, that's great. Um, and what I, you know, I want to talk about a little bit about people, right? I mean, so there's, you know, one of your, your big competitor or Amazon and, and some others have gotten a lot of heat, I guess, uh, 
for you know, especially how the way they kind of took care of their workers, you know, frontline workers in warehouses and distribution centers. I mean, you're in a similar situation with having uh, you know workers that you know kind of kind of in the front lines. How have you dealt with that? And you know, what what's Box done to address that? Um, so that is, uh, uh, it was a bit of vindication for me personally, I feel like, because, um, uh, um, you know, all these years we treated our folks in the facilities quite well. So between providing free health care, free health insurance for them, um, you know, uh, uh, great paid leave when we didn't need to, um, to just a, a whole slew of benefits um, uh, for them uh, that were not really market. Um, uh, for typical hourly employees in a fulfillment center environment. Um, and so uh, I used to get a lot of flack uh, for it from our board and investors that were just like, what are you doing, dude? Like, do you, are you running a business or a charity here? Um, and I told them like, it's not mutually exclusive. Like, uh, you know, you can treat folks well and still build a big business. And um, now though, I think we've been vindicated in our approach because as COVID kind of um, began to rise, you read about all these clusters happening in other uh, fulfillment centers and people kind of calling out sick or going on strike, just not coming into work. We saw about two days of, of, of increased call outs um, before we called in all hands with all of our fulfillment center staff. And what we told them is that, listen guys, you can do nothing but trust us at this point. Like when we, um, uh, when we um, quote unquote, uh, when it wasn't in vogue, to treat you guys uh, uh, like a member of a team, stock options, free health insurance, all these other things, college benefits. Um, we did that because you are an integral part of the team. So when we say we're trying to keep you safe and we're going to do everything possible to, to maintain that safe environment, um, you have to trust us. Uh, and I hope we've built enough goodwill for you to do that. And the next day, uh, luckily, um, uh, it was the last day of, of increased call outs. And from there on out, uh, you know, it's been, uh, uh, you know, all hands at, on deck and, and we've had uh, uh, great uh, attendance. So, so, you know, I think for folks that didn't traditionally treat their teams well, uh, you know, it's easy for, you know, it's easy to feel like, oh, I can just suddenly say, oh, I'm going to treat you well going forward. But, you know, people are pretty smart. You know, they're going to be like, mm, my bullshit radar is going off. Uh, when they suddenly need me, now I'm going to be treated well. I don't know about this. Um, and luckily, we've done it uh, uh, throughout the history of our company. And, uh, and do you still pay for people's weddings? I remember that you got some news on that a few years ago. We do. Uh, and I still have never been invited to a wedding, Josh. So, uh, uh, so these folks are, uh, are, are way smart. They're like, I, I, I'll take the wedding benefit, but I, last thing I want is my boss here uh, 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 drunk and at the bar. So, uh, so I have never been to an employee wedding yet. Oh, well, you know, next time you can hang out with me when there's a wedding. Um, yeah. Uh, I want to talk about future trends. So where, where do you think things are going? A lot of our, our discussions today are going to be about the future of, of different categories, but for, for your business and, you know, where do you think this, this goes from here? What's it look like over the next year? It's so interesting. I love the slide that you had about what Amazon categories, because uh, we are seeing that shift as well. So uh, from traditionally just hand sanitizer, toilet paper, you're starting to see more, more, more uh, like kind of uh, things around the kitchen. So flour has become a hot commodity. It's like, it's wild, man. I feel like we've, we've like, we're in a different era where like I'm here saying flour is a hot commodity. <laughs> um, but uh, all those like baking kits, baking goods, all those things are, are, are doing quite well for us. Um, I think going forward, we will settle into a new baseline of online grocery. Traditionally, we've been about four to 5%. Um, uh, but now it will be, uh, I think, at least double that from what I've seen. All the latest surveys has it pegged at like 15 to 20% is the run rate that we're at now. Um, but I can see us settling in at, at, at least 10%. And here's a random thought starter where I don't know where this goes beyond that. But you know, traditionally you've seen grocery drive a lot of traffic. So you have to go to the grocery store, you go into a physical grocery store. But those folks have, they're tight on space, right? So the back rooms are tiny. They try to sell some lawn chairs in the front after the register. They'll sell some fireworks. They're trying to drive more margin that way, but they're physically constrained. Um, but now if, if 10, 15, 20% of grocery is online, then online, you're not physically constrained. Um, and so if you're driving significant traffic through the sale of goods, what else can some of the grocers begin to sell uh, to these online customers now that they're not space constrained? 
And I think that will be an interesting trend uh, that you'll see online grocers begin to take care, take um, uh, advantage of selling more to those same customers coming back every week. So are there other categories um, or type, you know, other brands you're looking to align with that, you know, to kind of take advantage of that um, outside of just the online grocery category? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so for us, we've been, we've done a lot of thinking there because, um, you know, a typical customer of box now is coming back every, you know, you know, two times a month, three times a month. Um, and so they're not just buying box stuff online, right? What else are they buying and how can we service them? Uh, um, uh, how can we service them? Is without carrying the physical inventory is how we're thinking about it. Great. Um, and then uh, kind of final th train of thought, just advice, you know, we have on, you know, on this presentation, lots of different um, marketers, business leaders, any advice, you know, uh, in either from leading teams or just kind of getting through this, the next few months um, or next few in, in the next year. Um, just be nimble, man. Yeah. You know, it's like, I think uh, um, even as a startup, uh, hopefully if there's other big companies on, um, uh, you know, I, I'm not so fully hubris to say we did everything right. Um, even for us, it's like, man, a lot of stuff, you know, we're figuring out in real time because the world is changing in real time, um, faster than any time in, in probably online history. So, um, uh, if we're even feeling the, the, the pressure to move fast, then I can only imagine what bigger companies are, are feeling at the moment. So, um, but hopefully, um, you know, I can, I can kind of say something that we're all in it together uh, in the sense that, you know, even we're feeling the pressure to move faster. So um, the grass isn't always greener and, and we're in a lot of ways figuring it out ourselves as well. Yeah. I, I saw a presentation uh, by Jim Collins this week and he, he made a good point. He said, you know, no one knows where, where you're going, but the one thing you can do as a leader is figure out who's on your bus, right? Who's the team kind of that's going to drive with, you know, drive with you there. So um, and I think to your point, you know, your team seems like you did a lot of that prep work before the crisis, right? So you had a, had a kind of cohesive group going forward. Yeah, we just lucked out, Josh. You know, when we look back, and it's probably too early to do, to do a, a, a look back, but at least right now, the anecdotal kind of uh, chats around Zoom, you know, there's no more water cooler chats, is that, um, thank gosh, we had built for Easter Sunday, basically. And so we had automation built. We had all these kind of tech uh, tools built. And then, and then we were, we were well prepared, I think. And, and I, I hope, you know, if we end up being a public company uh, someday that uh, people will see that we were able to kind of um, uh, swallow this demand and, and do quite well in this era. Great. Are you announcing today your IPO? Is that like- Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Josh, it's not the NBC. We're all awesome. <laughs> I, I have delusions of grandeur. Um, we do have some questions from some of the, the uh, attendees. So uh, one is, uh, what is your view on comparison pricing and other other comparison metrics online for customers uh, to refer to? Um, so that's a really good question. And we're constantly testing it. Traditionally, in box, you see compared to retail. Um, and so we're in the middle of a big test of whether we just delete that or whether we flesh that out even more and be even more transparent. So uh, do people just want to drop down of saying, uh, hey, this is the exact price of this item and these are the retailers that have it to show you what we're charging for it so that you're not kind of uh, alt tabbing away from, from box. Um, uh, or is it just completely kind of getting away from it that, you know, if we say you're going to save 15% from versus retail that people are so jaded online these days that they don't trust anybody. So they're like, well, I'm going to find out myself. And it's just, it, it's just like more clutter on a, on a product description page. So we're, we're testing it at the moment. Um, I, I think with, when it comes to pack sizes, it's, it's a little bit harder to price compare uh, in our category. Um, the retail packs of something like, like, like this thing, which is like liquid gold these days, this, is, this single tube canister is sold by, I'm not kidding you, probably 500 retailers in America. But the 12 pack of that though, that's only certain wholesalers, some of whom don't sell that exact pack online. So it becomes like buying a mattress it's really hard mm -hmm. to begin to compare the exact models. Um, so, so that's why we're, we're, we're undergoing an A-B test on all of this. One thing we saw, especially working with some of our bigger e-commerce clients was, um, you know, it wasn't just price, but it was shipping speeds, right? That became very varied uh, between uh, companies. Uh, and I think that was one area that consumers 
weren't able to easily compare, um, you know, that because you thought, oh, Amazon, I'm always going to get things in two days. And then all of a sudden when this thing hit, it was like, oh, this thing's not going to show for a month. Right. Um, so I don't know if you've looked into that, like the, the pain. That factor. is spot on. So uh, as we uh, as we even have to evolve, um, we first started as just, hey, you know, buy big, big sizes online. Um, what we found is that what's resonating even more these days is customers are coming to us because not only is it easy to shop, not just like fast delivery, but it's easy to get through the through the actual cart building process. Remember, on average, people spend a hundred bucks and ten items in their typical cart uh, for a for a consumer unbox, which is a lot. Um, but what we found in recent uh, uh, data is that trust is becoming um, uh, an increasingly uh, uh, kind of big factor of why people are shopping with us. So what does that mean? Well, of course, it's trust that we have it in stock and that we're going to get it to you, not in two weeks, uh, that it's going to come uh, within our SLA. Um, but third, and most importantly, that you know, if you order granola from us, um, you're not going to, you're going to get it from us in a neatly packaged uh, um, uh, box. And that granola is straight from the manufacturer to you. Uh, whereas, you know, on other platforms, open marketplace, Places, you might get a bag of granola that's dusty wrapped in duct tape from Hong Kong and you're just like wow I didn't know Bob's Red Mill had a plant in Hong Kong <laughs> and yeah the reality is they don't you know so someone is printing Bob's Red Mill there so so that authenticity um, uh, and that trust factor is becoming more important with online food great um, and I think we just have a, a few more a few more minutes um, just I also wanted to ask you about other like other grocery companies, other big retailers that may not be as technically forward as you, like what, what are you seeing happening out there? How, how did, are they being left behind? Are they going to be you know, out of business or, you know, what's that evolution going to look like? No, I actually think the opposite. You mean grocers or retailers? In well, yeah. I mean, we can start with grocers. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, uh, uh, grocers, um, I think this is their second wind, you know, uh, traditionally super thin margin, super low growth, but, they're sitting on 50, some of them are sitting on 50% year over year comps, 100% year over year comps on big numbers. So they've got a huge windfall where they could pay down debt or invest into e-commerce. So I think you'll see them do a little bit of both. This is also highlighted, I think, that you know, your, 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 your typical 40K, 50,000 square foot uh, grocery store um, is actually pretty important to society. Like, could you imagine a world during this time when your typical grocery store just wasn't around because they had all gotten disrupted? Like, oh my gosh, like mass pandemonium. So I think that they have a second wind and I think the smart ones will evolve the store footprint and invest into e-commerce. The ones that don't or didn't do so well through this uh, pandemic, I think those folks are going to go away uh, pretty right. quickly, probably. Um, and is that still a business line for you guys to power some of those other, other grocers? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's been one of the uh, uh, tailwinds that we've seen is the amount of folks, not only here, but internationally that have kind of wanted to partner on technology, that it's been, it's been a lot. Um, retail though, in general, uh, I think outside of food retail, traditional brick and mortar retail, uh, it's still in for very kind of, very nasty reckoning, I feel like. Um, but retail in general dies a slow death. I, I like to call them like crustaceans. You ever watch these like National Geographic uh, movies where like a crab gets in trouble? And then they're just like, here, you can have my arm. Uh, and so they cut off their own arm, just like in a day scurry away. Retailers, a lot of them own so much, so much real estate that right. like they just sell off chunks at a time. And then they can prolong their lives by years just by selling off like assets. And you do, Kmart and Sears is still in business. Like that's crazy to think, but they're still there because they're just selling assets nonstop. Right. Um, so I, I think it'll be a slow decline, but it, definitely a decline in traditional retail. The sinking ships, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we're just about at time. So, Che, I want to thank you for for joining, uh, taking some time out of your busy day, and sharing some of the insights. And you know, hope, we'll throw out some box promo codes later to all the attendees. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Some, some great questions uh, on the uh, chat that I'm sorry I wasn't able to answer, but definitely some thought provokers on healthcare yeah. being an advantage and also uh, how we're trying to get folks to recycle the boxes. So, um, definitely both are high on our minds. I'm just sorry I couldn't I couldn't get there. Oh, yeah. Sorry. All right. Well, thanks, Che. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll and we'll be sending people uh, follow ups to the slides, and you know they can find you on LinkedIn and, and other ways as well. Okay. Cool, guys. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye. All right. So for for those uh, uh, are with us still, um, our next session will start in about a minute, and it's going to be um, Amazon and the future of e-commerce.